I'm going to thank everyone for joining us tonight for Lethbridge Public Library. So you want to run, run for office. Um, uh, women in local government session. Uh, my name is Bonnie and I'm uh, the manager for uh, business development for the Lethbridge Public Library. And my partner here is um, Jonathan Jarvis. He's one of our, adult, our information services librarians. Um, I just want to start with acknowledging that we're on the gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains Treaty 7 territory and pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present and future while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. Uh, the city of Lethbridge is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Um, so our speakers today, we have um, Lisa Lambert from the University of Lethbridge. Uh, Lisa is a political scientist and advocate for women in politics, as well as being a special instructor at the University of Lethbridge for 12 years. She served six years with the Legislative Assembly of Alberta as the assistant to MLA Shannon Phillips. Lisa was born in Lethbridge and has raised her family here while pursuing her graduate studies at the Universities of Lethbridge and Calgary. And then joining us uh, after Lisa for the Q&A, we have Mayor Jennifer Hadley of Handley of the town of Nanton. We have Tanya Thorne, a counselor from town of Okotoks, and counselor Heather Caldwell from the town of Colehurst. And I'll hand it off to you, Lisa. Great, thank you uh, very much, Bonnie. I'm just going to um, begin to share. So I'll, I have to do this in every one of my classes in which I sort of change the frame a little bit. So there we go. Okay, so of course, um, I'm going to talk uh, about running as a woman in politics. Um, and I come at this, uh, as, uh, as Bonnie said, uh, as a pracademic, I call myself. Um, I'm both an academic um, and uh, I work in this field uh, practically. Um, I've been able to be a volunteer for provincial and uh, municipal candidates and uh, been lucky enough to serve on both winning and losing campaigns. I will say that the winning campaigns are slightly funner uh, than the losing ones. Um, and uh, I have been able to study the political careers and uh, of women and, and uh, the political behavior of voters for the last two decades. Um, what I hope to do then in this, uh, in this short 20 minutes is just to bring a, a bit of the sort of academic perspective um, to uh, women running to um, make sure that you know uh, sort of some of the real uh, pieces of it in terms of um, what the uh, research has shown. And I'm really looking forward to actually hearing from the women who've been elected because that is not what I have done. That is not what I bring to this. Um, so first of all, let's start with taking a look at um, women running around uh, you know, across Canada. So at the federal level, um, what I can tell you is that, you know, over the years since the 80s, when, uh, you know, the hair was big, um, we have now gotten into the 2020s and about 30% of the women elected to the House of Commons, uh, or 30% 30, 30 of the MPs elected are women. Um, it does, it's, you know, it's certainly better than 10% in the 80s, uh, but we're nowhere near um, halfway yet. But you would say, well, but, you know, that's federal and federal issues are, are different issues than um, what maybe some women would be interested in. And maybe they don't want to be traveling and that kind of thing. So provinces must be better, right? And I would say, well, okay, I'll, I'm going to show you what it looks like for uh, these bars are all the percentage of legislators who are uh, self-identifying as women. And uh, in 2018, uh, it was a little bit better in Alberta than it is now. It's gone down a little bit. But if we look across all these provinces, uh, what we see is that of the 758 elected members in, in provinces, 260 of them are women, 34%. Okay, It's about a third. But you say, well, municipalities are better, though, right? I mean, surely people are much more concerned about their local things. So I took a look at the, uh, that. The uh, councillors that are identified as uh, women across the country, uh, and this is uh, 2015 data, um, about 26% are female. So over and over, what we see is that um, at every level, women are underrepresented. 
And what I'm going to tell you is sort of the end that I'm going to get to. I'm going to tell you the beginning uh, at the beginning. First of all, women are underrepresented, not because of anything that you are doing wrong as women. There is nothing wrong with you. Women are underrepresented because ma men are overrepresented. That is as simple as it gets, okay? Um, what does it look like in a municipality? Well, I looked across Alberta, and um, outside of Red Deer and the rural municipality of um, Wood Buffalo, uh, in the 10 largest cities, um, it continues to be uncommon for women to be elected, okay? So the, the Lethbridge numbers of one in nine in our, in our current is matched in Medicine Hat with one in nine, um, is you know, ratio wise, pretty much the same in Edmonton of two and 13. Um, really, it's wood, uh, wood Buffalo that stands out and Red Deer that stand out. Every other place is, is really predominantly men. So what are my three key points that I'm going to talk about tonight? Well, I'm going to tell you first of all, first of all that women belong in the council chamber and representation matters. Second, I'm going to talk about how it's not voters. Voters are just as likely to win, to vote for a woman as a man, but men are more likely to run. So that's why men are overrepresented. Uh, and the third thing I'm going to talk about is that the usual intervention that we talk about for women being underrepresented is an individual level solution um, like this, like me talking to you here is an individual level solution um, aimed at making women feel, you know, more confident about running or t saying you can do it, that kind of thing. But really, uh, women's underrepresentation at all levels is an institutional and systemic issue um, that are to blame and not individual level issues. This is not about you not being good enough or adequate enough. Let's talk about first representation, representation matters. So when we look at these two pictures of Lethbridge's and um, Wood Buffalo's, uh, we see what the difference is for representation in a um, descriptive way, okay? So this is the difference between uh, us seeing ourselves represented in the people who lead us and us not feeling as represented, right? Um, in Lethbridge, we have had just, uh, I think the most we've ever had was two uh, women on council of nine. Uh, we've never gotten anywhere close to being um, half of the council, much less more than half. Um, and it and it does matter for a couple of things. We know from research that it matters for women paying attention to politics, and it matters for younger women seeing politics as a career. So I want to encourage you that if nothing else, uh, to to run means to give younger women an opportunity to see themselves represented and see a career in politics as being something they might be able to do. So that's the first thing. Let's look at voter bias. So there is a, an um, article by uh, Sevi and Errol Bunduk and Blay that asked and answered this question. They asked quite simply, this is an uh, academic journal, do women get fewer votes? Question, no, is the answer. It's just that simple. But it's actually even more interesting than that. Um, the data at the bottom is from a brand new paper that was just released in 2021 by uh, Sevi uh, and a few other people. And what they look at is municipal elections across Canada, and they look over all of the years. And what they find here, if you don't know how to read these boring uh, regression results, is that being an incumbent gives people a uh, 34 percentage point um, boost so to speak. So if you're an incumbent in an election, you're going to have this boost uh, because of, of your name, right? People recognize your name. Um, if you're a woman in a municipal election, you're going to get a 0 0.06, so a six percentage point boost. You heard me correctly. Being a woman is actually an advantage in municipal elections. Now, I'm going to suggest what I think the reason for this is. At, um, in municipal elections in Canada, it, we almost never have parties. Uh, so it, um, in, in Alberta, we certainly don't. But in most uh, pro parts um, of Canada, we don't have parties at the municipal level. And in the absence 
of that heuristic, that sort of shortcut about who to vote for. Voters don't know who to vote for by, based on party, so they're using another heuristic that they fall back on. They're using gender, but it's benefiting women because when voters look at a list and all they can see is is uh, names and they, so they can identify gender from that, then they are more likely to vote for women. Okay, this is fantastic, I hope. I hope this gives you great encouragement and fortitude. So now that I'm hopefully giving you two good reasons to run for politics, first of all, it's so good for the children. And second of all, you'll, you'll get this boost. Now I wanna talk about what you should um, plan on knowing. Okay, what do you need to know about being ready? You need to know what a municipality does and where that authority comes from. You need to know what makes you eligible. Who do you need to have on your team? And what's it gonna to take to win? I'm gonna do some of this pretty quickly because I'm mostly gonna just direct you to where uh, you're gonna find some of the answers because I really wanna to get to what's it gonna to take to win. So municipal, municipalities are just a creature of the province. That's the actual language of a, in the constitution. They're a delegated authority. The mayor is elected the same as the council and ha is not the boss of the council. And they're not chosen by the council, okay? Um, the governance model is what is used and it you look at things that are governance policy based and not operational the key to this is understanding what the municipal governance act does and reading it right knowing what you can do um in terms of what they what municipalities do i've got it on here you know it's like a big part of the budget is um, fire ems police and emergency services in larger centers it'll be local transit things like that but I know um, a, a Calgary insider who said 80% of the discussions are land use. I want to hear from the elected um, officials later uh, as to whether or not they would agree with that. Is 80% to what you do land use? Maybe it is. So that's what municipalities do. What does it take to run? Well, whenever I tell my students what it takes to run, they always say to me, I had no idea it took so little. Yeah, it doesn't take that much. You have to be 18 on the day of the election. You have to be resident in the riding that you're running in, like the place that you're running, the municipality, um, for six months. You have to not be an employee of the jurisdiction, or you have to be on leave if you are. You can't be in tax arrears. This is the tightest one because you have to uh, not have any arrears for most uh, places. And you can't be somebody who's already been disqualified. And that's, you know, a, a couple of, of people, but not tons. Your nomination papers have to be signed. It's anywhere from five to 100, depending on the rules of the municipality. And you have to have a, an official agent if you want one. You'll have to present a deposit of uh, between 100 to $1,000. You'll get a part of that back uh, or all of that back if you get a certain percentage of the votes. And you should have a bank account for campaign donations and expenses. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute just a bit more about fundraising and, and donations. You should have a team, though, uh, besides yourself, choose some of your friends who can do these things. Like the official agent is the person who really likes rules. Get your rules friend to do this. Have somebody that's good at writing to look at your content. Uh, have a person that's good at asking for money to do that. It's often not you. Uh, you should be, you should get comfortable at doing it, but um, really it should be somebody else who can help you with that as well. Maybe somebody that's good at social media. Um, th this is, you know, part of what you should be doing. It's not all of what you should be doing. Um, and uh, someone to go door knock with you. Um, and I'm gonna come back to door knocking in a minute. What do you need to know about fundraising and disclosures and things like that? You, look, this is why I say get a, an official agent who really likes to track things and be following the rules because this is um, the area where you're gonna get into trouble if you don't do it properly. Um, and if you accept a donation that you're not allowed to accept. Donations come from individual Albertans and they are maxed at $5,000 from a donor. Um, you have to be dominated before you can accept that money, but you can take pledges before that. And you have a bank account where you put the money once you've accepted $1,000. Okay, so just have somebody who knows these rules. This is really uh, key to it. But I, what I want you to understand, because most women, when I talk to them about running, their concern is that they won't be able to raise enough money and that it's so much money. Okay, it's not that much money. I want to uh, show you a chart that I created 
Um, so it's not, it's imperfect. But I looked back over the last seven elections or so in, um, in Lethbridge and looked at how much it took to win and how much it took to lose. Okay. And it's not just about money. Um, so over here, what I've done is I've said, uh, how much did people spend in each of the elections? Okay. So in 2017, um, the average winner spent about, uh, spent $5,300. The average loser the, who got more than 3,000 votes. So I took a, a basic, I took like the bottom people that, you know, were getting like 70 votes. I just took them off the list. I said, okay, there's a group of people who were close and there's a group of people who won. To win, about 5,300 bucks. The people who lost, roughly 2,800. Okay. Can you raise more than 3,000 bucks? Yeah, you can. Okay. You can self donate too. You can in Lethbridge you can donate or you can fund up to ten thousand dollars of it. So uh different areas are different. But um you know in the twenty thirteen one it took a little bit more to win, but it also took a little bit more to lose. Look at that. It took sixty two hundred bucks uh for the losers in twenty thirteen. In twenty ten, um again it was a little bit less than twenty thirteen, but not uh not as low as twenty seventeen. 2007 was a weird one because in 2007, um, we didn't have a, a mayor uh, running because it was by acclamation. When you have an acclamation election, uh, problem is that you are just going to have fewer people turn out, right? So turnout was lowest in that one. Um, and so therefore, it also didn't take very much money to win, right? That like less than $3,000 to win. And this one uh, was skewed because one of the people who lost spent a great deal of money and lost, <laughs> but but spent a great deal of money doing it. Um, that that's a bit uncommon. 2004 shows you that you know winners and losers pretty much the same. Overall, less than five thousand dollars to win, about four thousand four hundred to lose. So that's not a ton of money. And I'm hoping that you can see within that that it's totally doable to be able to raise that kind of money. That if you ask people for money, they'll often be able to give you a hundred, two hundred. $500. You can self um, fund as well and uh, up like in, in Lethbridge up to $10,000. Now, how many votes does it take to win? So that's this side and that's the black line. Well, in the 2017, it took uh, about 7,200 votes to win. So in other words, the top councillors, the top eight councillors um, were all elected and the bottom vote of that was 7,200. In other years, it's been lower, right? In 2013, it, it took less than 6,000 votes. Um, in 2007, where there was poor turnout, remember, no mayor uh, campaign, it only took 5,200 votes to win uh, a council position. So I ask you, can you get about, um, so the average here, 6,000 votes, 6,300 votes, and about, $5,300. That's what it's going to take to win. Okay. Oh, now, I'm going to just talk very briefly about, uh, I'm not going to touch much on fundraising, you're going to have to ask for money. And unless you secretly have $10,000 sitting around, but, um, you know, much of what you're going to be doing is actually asking for votes. And um, a mantra that I like to say is, uh, there's no point in doing anything unless uh, where you're asking people to vote for you unless you are writing down their name and their phone number as well. You want to collect data on the people who say they will vote for you because you want to remind them to go vote for you on election day. It's really that simple. Collect the data um, so that you can then phone and ask them or remind them to vote. And the best way to honestly do it is with cell phones as much as you can because then you can just text message people to remind them. Um, how do you get people to uh, to vote for you? Well, you talk to them um, and you collect that data. So door knocking still is the best way to gain votes. You go door to door and that's why you have somebody on your team who likes to go door to door. I love going door to door. I completely adore this time. And it, after elections, I have to uh, remind myself that it's not okay anymore to just randomly knock on people's doors and ask them who they're going to vote for. Um, I actually love this part. And um, if you, you know, if you talk to 10 people, you're going to find one person who probably is like me and likes to talk 
and, and do this kind of thing. But again, the key is not just to have a one-way conversation, not just giving information and you know saying, hey, please vote, is actually to say, can I count on your vote? And then can I put your name and phone number so I can remind you? Okay, so can I count on your vote? And you know, may I take your name and, and phone number so I can remind you of this? Now you're not gonna be able to speak to 6,000 people. You really won't. That's a very challenging thing to do. Um, but if you can speak to a few hundred households or even a couple of thousand households, you've probably got enough to win, okay? Um, a couple of hundred is probably a really good start. And when you start doing it, you will start to see uh, how lovely it is and how fun it is. And so um, I, I strongly encourage it. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a House of Commons hearings uh, on getting women into politics. And there was a couple of pieces I wanted to take from it just as I wrap up. In that, um, in those hearings, um, the mayor of Banff, Karen Sorensen, said that the media needs to, quote, stop asking if a woman can be both a politician and a mom. I want to suggest to you that maybe part of what you can do is if, if you're worried about this, is you can start by not just leading with your parental or social status. And this is a typical for women when they run, they will say, you know, I'm a mom and I'm I blah. Uh, start with um, your qualifications. Um, I've lived in this town for however many years, or I was the person who helped get the arena going or something like that, right? Uh, put your social status in there if you'd like or your parental status, but don't necessarily lead with it, okay? Most parents uh, work outside their home. Politicians are no different. Uh, you wouldn't present uh, your children as a reason to get a job anywhere else. You don't need to with politics either. Um, the committee was also told that the media is more likely to refer to female politicians by their first names, which, quote, downplays their contributions and capabilities as serious politicians. And I agree, this is one of the ways that um, you can be diminished. So I want to, for the most part, uh, encourage you to use your surname when you're running, right? So you're not just voting for Lisa, you're voting for, you know, Lambert, right? Lisa Lambert is who you're voting for. Oh no, I'll never run, but so you're never gonna have to vote for me, don't worry. Um, in certain circumstances, I might say, you know, I might ch change this a little bit and somebody like Belinda could run as Belinda, right? Uh, because she would be both, you know, using her, her first name recognition, but also she's using her incumbency. And if Belinda were to run, remember, she'd have a 34 point bump from incumbency and a six point bump from being a uh, female. So she'd be, that'd be pretty good. Uh, finally, Dr. Melanie Thomas has found that just 1% uh, of women and 5% of men have ever considered running for office. So I wanna thank you if you are considering it for being part of that special group. I want to encourage you to make the decision sooner rather than later about running. Get your ducks in a row today and be ready to run so that you're not making a last minute decision. If I can be any help to any of you in um, either making a decision or about building your team or anything about financial things, um, or, you know, or if you want to start by asking me for money, uh, this is how you get in touch uh, with me. And uh, with that, I will um, turn it back over to uh, turn it back over and uh, let, I think it's Jonathan that's going to run the Q&A. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, just let Jonathan get organized here and great information. I would be one of those people who would like to like run the rules and stuff, but not knock on doors. So <laughs> excellent. There you go. All right. Like, here's Jonathan. There's always people. There's always people who want to do that kind of work. Yeah. Right, here's Jonathan. Okay. So anyone who has any questions for Lisa, you can type them into the Q and A at the bottom of the screen. There's a little Q and A button right sort of in the center. And I'll read out your questions to her. Um, we do have the video and uh, chat features turned off for the attendees. So just type in your questions and I can read them out. We do have one question to start with. Um, it's an anonymous person. They don't want to run, but they want to support candidates. How is municipal organizing different from other kinds of political organizing and what makes a su successful municipal campaign? Yeah, so, it, um... 
one of the key differences with municipal elections is that there are no parties. And so typically at the provincial or federal level, if you're supporting a candidate, you're doing it with the backing of a party and with, uh, you know, all that, all that that brings in terms of resources, um, but also, um, you know, kind of background policy and, and recog recognition, right? Um, it is more difficult to, um, to do some components of municipal electioneering because there are not those heuristics, as I call them, right? Those shortcuts for voters. Yeah. Voters use the shortcut of party to vote at the provincial and federal levels. Mm -hmm. And without it at the municipal level, it can be a little bit more challenging. So um, certainly uh, door knocking is gonna be one of the key things. Um, in smaller communities, you might want to consider um, you know, doing things, and this is going to be difficult with COVID, but like, you know, po a, a, like a coffee event where, you know, you have like a, you know, pop in and talk to me over coffee or something like that. You, you can do um, meet and greets in larger communities. I've certainly gone with candidates to these kind of forums, uh, you know, meet and greet things. But where candidates will often get really swamped without that party stuff, is at the municipal level they get asked for a lot of questionnaires and i and i'm hoping that the um the people who've been elected can talk about just the amount of time that you're asked to like campaign right i mean campaigning should be a part-time thing if you're campaigning for a part-time job which almost every council member is across the province um, but really it can be very time consuming because of that. So that component of it, of the sort of answering questionnaires, um, is one of the, the pieces that, um, is quite different at the municipal level. And I would encourage you again, as part of your team to have people who can do that kind of work for you that can sit and write, you know, answers to the questions and then also just don't answer some of them. Everybody and their dog will be sending you questionnaires. <laughs> um, somebody that sort of as a follow up to that, how do you find people to be on your team if you don't currently know anyone who can sort of fill those support roles for you? Okay, uh, wow, great question. Uh, again, I, I'm going to turn, you know, some of those, I think some of those questions are going to be great for the electeds in the room uh, in a minute. So let, let's take that back to them as well. Um, but I would say, you know, start with, um, thinking about the people in your life who uh, would be helpful and then contacting them. Like if you contact 20 people and, and say like, you know, I'm looking for money, I'm looking for support, you might be, uh, you might be surprised at who steps forward, right? And who has some time to do things uh, and who has the money to give to you. Um, so make a list of people who, um, who, who could be those people. They don't have to be the closest of friends. That's, I guess, one of, and I, I think the elected will, help us on this a bit too. Okay. Um, somebody is asking if you could sort of speak to knowledge gaps. They feel that they don't know everything that they need to know about say taxes and mill rates. Is that a huge barrier to running or what okay. kind of difference does that make? <laughs> so, so this is where I'm gonna be incredibly frank. Um, no, it isn't because have you met other politicians? Okay, so uh, <laughs> you know, like please, let us remember back to uh, the, la the 2017 election in which the candidate who won the most number of votes in Lethbridge, and I won't say his name, but he stood up at forum after forum after forum and said, well, I don't know about that. I've never heard of that. The MGA, I don't know what that thing is. He didn't have a clue about that stuff. So when you ask that question, I don't have to know what your name is because I know you're probably a woman that would ask that question. Because women, what we know from the evidence is women will say that they are underqualified even when they are more than qualified. And men will often think they are qualified even when they don't know what the MGA is, okay? So try to um, overcome your, your desire to have to know everything, okay? You don't have to know everything to be able to run. It, it'd be great if you read the MGA and knew what it was, you know, you don't have to know everything. And these things, a lot of them are learnable. Okay. Somebody's sort of asking about political systems. Would a ward system be better for women in terms of making it easier to choose to be a better candidate? 
Yeah, th there's really mixed reviews. I'm a big fan of ward systems, but wards uh, have fewer women. They do have, they have less, um, let me say, let me uh, say it the right way. In a ward system, women are less likely to be elected, okay? Um, At-large systems do elect more women. Um, this is, it's the problem of every electoral system around the world. When you have one winner, that winner is often a man. When you have more than one winner, so in an at-large system, you have more than one winner, you uh, are much more likely to elect women. Okay. So I, I would love to see a ward system for very many reasons, but electing women would not be the one. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kathy is asking, um, what can people do now to prepare to run for office? Having not done it before, like, should they start right away? And what steps are the first ones to take? Absolutely. Again, the elected are going to be great at this, but I would say um, just like in any campaign, like a, a federal or provincial campaign, you work backwards from election day. And so you look at E-Day, like when is E-Day? And then you work backwards to when you have to have things done. You'll have to have a nomination sheet in by such and such a day. You'll have to have all of that uh, ready. You're, so you just work backwards and you start to set um, some of your goals for right now um, of being getting pledges, getting your team pulled together, um, getting your nomination sheets uh, ready to go, and then you, uh, you know, plan for the, the big rally, uh, you know, the big push after you've got your nomination papers in, mm -hmm. because that's when you can start to fundraise. And we have somebody asking, another anonymous person asking, is there any books or documents that you would recommend looking for information in to know, find out what information you should know to be a candidate? Uh, absolutely. And I think the city of Lethbridge actually puts out a lot of this. Most municipalities do as well. The Alberta government has um, excellent uh, material on this. Um, like they actually have, you know, sort of the, the what to, what you need to know to run. Um, if you want to send me an email, I can, I'm happy to uh, send people um, sort of reading lists and, uh, uh, and answer direct questions as well. And I will note as well on the uh, page where you registered for today's uh, session, there is a link to the City of Lethbridge's webpage that has a lot of the documents that they've put together. So that's a, a good place to start as well. So. And the provincial government as well, remember, because the provincial government it, um, is like basically every power of a municipality comes from the province. They are the, they're the children of the province. <laughs> uh, they're the creation of the province. So the province uh, under municipal affairs department has a lot of materials that are really good. So go on to the uh, government of Alberta municipal affairs page and you'll find a lot there too. Okay. Uh, one other question we have here. Somebody wants to know, is it important to have someone that's sort of a, a campaign manager versus just doing, running their campaign with family and friends? Does it make a difference to have somebody sort of in that official role? Right. I, I mean, that, that's really uh, up to you. And I think um, for many candidates that I've talked to, these are the kinds of things to have like that deep, thought about your own capacity, what are you good at, and what do you need help with, mm -hmm. and then also what your family uh, is useful for uh, and what they're not useful for. So in some situations, partners can be great at this, right? And so you may have a partner um, who is fantastic at helping you organize things and get, and in other situations, I've talked to cabinet ministers who say, my partner was useless, you know, <laughs> like not helpful at all. I had my girls around me, right? Um, so, you know, if you, if you have supportive people in your family and in your life, that's great. If you don't, you may want to have a campaign manager who helps you navigate your family issues, right? And helps you get coordinate your time and be, is the person who says no to people. Like basically, uh, you know, those kinds of volunteers can be the ones who can take uh, some of the heat off of you. Uh, of having to, to say no or having to say, oh, I can't be there or coordinating your life in such a way. I mean, a lot of what I do, you know, in my day-to-day -day life is I say all the time, it's, it's about carrying a purse, right? I carry my, my member's purse, um, you know, which is also to say, I almost always make sure that I have water with me for her, that, you know, there's a snack, 
that I know where she has to be. The char the phones are charged up. Uh, you know, there's gas in the tank, like all of those kind, just those logistical things. A campaign manager can be really helpful for just those logistical things to get places. Um, someone was uh, asked. There seems to be a fair amount of uh, women who are in the mayor role in different uh, municipalities. Is it easier for women to get elected to be mayor than say a councillor or? Well, in our system, it's no different because they're all running, um, you know, they're all running individually, right? So the mayor is a position just like any of the councillors, um, but there's only one position. Um, so in terms of mayors uh, across Canada, they have a lower percentage of them are women than councillors. Councillors about 26%, mayors I think are 20%. So it's actually a little bit tougher in some ways okay. to win. Now, um, I will say that like the electeds that we have on the, on, uh, you know, the call with us tonight, um, some of them are mayors and they may want to speak to this. In smaller towns, there may be... Um, some advantage uh, for for women to run. They may be better connected. They may have more uh, uh, name recognition, something like that, right? So, so there may be differences in terms of size of community. Okay. Um, I noticed in your presentation you said that door knocking is probably the most important um, strategy for getting elected. Do you think that's going to, with the whole COVID situation, is that going to play? A role in sort of decreasing the importance of that to social media take over? Yeah. Is it connecting with people or? This is a great question. And like we, we don't know, you know, in terms of the research. Um, we know that in the past, social media has been uh, not very effective because okay. social media is often like taking out a billboard, right? And I mean, if you right. took out a billboard on Scenic Drive that said, you know, elect Jim Jones or something like that, you know, like it would be maybe effective. You'd get your name out there, but you wouldn't actually know who was planning on voting for you. You wouldn't be able to remind them to vote. But, so social media can be that way. And that's one of the risks of it. When social media is truly social, in other words, going back and forth, and you can, you know, make these uh, kind of uh, discussions, you can have these kind of discussions with people, um, then it may be more effective and it may be like virtual door knocking, right? right. So if you're virtually door knocking, you're still gathering data. So I really wanna, like, I wanna hammer in two words to you tonight is data and dollars, right? <laughs> like data and dollars, you need to collect the data and you need the dollars uh, to be able right. to fund your campaign. So you can ask for them, ask for both, right? You're asking people for money and you're asking people to support you in the election. And when they say they'll support you, you write down their name and their phone number because that's right. what's going to be valuable for you later. So if the, so yeah, and in a COVID world, we may be doing virtual door knocking. Um, I have found people to be very willing to take phone calls during COVID. Like in before times, like none of us wanted to take phone calls, right? Like somebody would phone us and be like, what is, like, why is this, why are you phoning? Why didn't you text? Yeah. Right? Nowadays, I'm, it's very interesting. People are much more open to phone calls. Uh, so you know what, pick up the phone, start phoning people, you know, phone your friends and then ask for phone numbers for their friends and just, you know, the Fabergé commercial, you okay, so on and so on and so on. Well, it's amazing how even in my own work, people with, phone calls, they might be calling to ask about a book and you end up talking about your dogs for five minutes or something. People are just much more willing to talk nowadays. Absolutely. We're we just starved for that personal connection or, or what's going on, but. We are starved, we're all starved. Everybody <laughs> phone me. So yeah, yeah. no, it's true. Um, and the door knocking may or may not be something that we can do, right? I mean, in some of yeah. the elections that have been taking place under COVID, and we've had a number of provincial elections under COVID, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've had BC, Saskatchewan, the debacle that is currently going on in Newfoundland, um, you, the Yukon's gonna have one, right? So we've got some experience on this. They have been doing some door knocking. Um, so it's not completely outside the realm of possibilities. Um, but you should maybe consider the ways to do it uh, virtually. Yeah. Um, one final question before we move on to our panelists. So it's just in regards to door knocking, is it better to knock on the um, approach businesses when you're door knocking or individuals? Um, I, would, I would say mostly it's individuals. Um, uh, and you want to be doing this. Uh, typically, we're doing door knocking like 
in the evenings between four and eight and uh, on weekends, you know, weekend afternoons. Um, some people don't do it Sundays. That's kind of a personal choice as to whether you do it or not. Uh, but definitely Saturdays are great. And uh, I think it's individuals because individuals vote um, and businesses often consider that to be um, a form of, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like sort of soliciting, I guess, some mm -hmm. form of solicitation and, okay. and they don't like it. And it's not, and businesses can't donate, right? Businesses, it's um, individuals who donate. So you want to, if you're after money and you're after votes, uh, you, you know, data and dollars come from individuals. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. It's been very informative, a lot of information that I wasn't sure about. So I'm going to right now invite our three panelists to turn their video back on and we can jump right into some questions for them. So joining us are Tanya Thorne, um, a uh, councillor from Okotoks. Uh, Jennifer Henley is the mayor of Nanton, and we have Heather Caldwell, who is a councillor from Colhurst. Thank you for all taking the time to join us this evening. So one of the questions that sort of was asked by Lisa earlier was, what should a person do now to sort of start preparing? Do any of you have any suggestions on how you started your own campaigns and what they can do as first steps. I can, I don't know if somebody wants to jump in first or do you want me to just call call on different people? I can start. I'll start. Sure. <laughs> um, so I think the very first thing, if you're considering running, is figuring out your why and knowing exactly why you're running um, and being able to articulate it, um, understand it, be passionate about it, um, if you don't know your why, you will not get dollars and data, as, as Lisa was saying, um, because you won't resonate with those people. So I think that is getting really, really clear of why you believe you are the person or one of those people to be at that table. Yeah, and I would add to that as well, um, absolutely understanding your why and the value that you could bring to the council table. Um, but start attending council meetings, get your face out there, have the current council start recognizing, knowing that you're actually interested in um, the budgets and the land use conversations and just start learning now what this, what the municipality's learning. Yeah, absolutely. And if I can join in as well, I think those are really fantastic ideas. But you also have to have a conversation with your family. You have to have a conversation with your support team um, uh, and make sure because, you know, there is a there is a time commitment and there are going to be many evenings that you're away at meetings. And so you want to make sure that, you know, you have your 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 family is on board uh, for this kind of time commitment. Um, I'm not sure what it's going to look like with COVID, but uh, one of the things that I did in preparation was I just started to become more visible in my community. I was going out to all different kinds of events just to talk with people. Actually, you know what? I think that was something I was even doing before I ran, but, <laughs> but I did it with more intention to hear what was important to people to see, you know, am I, am I able to represent, uh, you know, people in this? I, I come from a very small town. Um, there's about 2,700 people. And so yeah, just getting out and talking to people and finding out what's really important to them and, you know, what kind of direction they would love to see this town grow in, right? Right. Leading on for um, in regards to time commitment, Heather, how much time does it you find that it takes for running in office? Once you're elected, how much time does it take, and what type of time commitments is there during your campaign? When I started campaigning, I'm a talker, Jonathan, so I love knocking on doors, and so it was a <laughs> big. But, <laughs> but it's a great feeling of getting just getting your finger on the pulse of your community and hearing what people have to say and and that and you have to feel passionate about that if you want to be successful uh you have to be really interested in what people are saying so so 
you know, in terms of time, I mean, there was many evenings that I was out and about and I had, um, you know, my eight year old, my 11 year old trailing along with me, uh, you know, carrying pamphlets and things. <laughs> um, once you get into office, I'm not sure if, if, I, if anybody else wants to jump onto that one. Or should I just keep chatting? Jennifer? Um, yeah, so, so just to let everyone know as well, um, I, I was on council first in 2013 as a councillor, and then I did run for mayor in 2017. So I do have um, experience in both capacities. And so as a councillor, I would say, because again, that was a small community, it was anywhere from five to 10 hours a week. Um, you're always on though, you're, whenever you're in the public, you're always on the job, everyone knows who you are. As the mayor, it's definitely a little bit more cumbersome and you're looking at more like 15 to 30 hours a week, depending on, on the meetings that you're, you're dealing with. Okay. I think what I would add to that is um, like every job, there's those that will be at the top of the scale and they give 955%. And there'll be those that are at the bottom of the scale that you're lucky if you're getting 5%. So figure out what it is that you have to give mm -hmm. um, it is probably that first response. And then don't remember that it's, uh, it's also a little bit more than just the meetings you have to go to because you need to understand the, especially in the city of Lethbridge, probably the volume of email that you might receive and that's internal email. <laughs> and resident email. Right. And then if you also decide that you wanna have a social media presence, it takes time to manage that because you can't just get on social media and, or you shouldn't, let me rephrase, you shouldn't just get on social media and tap out a response to something. You need to be thoughtful and strategic about how you respond and how you're engaging with your community. So all of those elements add time. So for myself, I'm in a community, it's 30,000 people. We're part-time, so, and they say all the time, it's about 20 hours. And I would love to just put 20 hours in a week. I'm probably anywhere, if I was to average it out of the whole year, I'm, I'm on average, probably 30 hours a week, minimum. Okay. Yeah. So we've got a couple of people asking about campaigning and sort of how did you approach putting a team together? Did you approach family and friends? Um, how did you find, maybe when you didn't have somebody like we asked Lisa, you don't have somebody that fits maybe the role of a campaign manager. How did you find somebody to fill some of these different roles if you don't have somebody in your own life that could support you that way? Uh, maybe we'll, we'll start with Jennifer this time and then we can go around. Um, yeah, so certainly starting with those nearest and dearest to you, bouncing ideas, kind of building excitement within. And um, I found that as soon as I, I, I developed a plan and I started knocking on doors, people, people started believing in what I had to offer and they started offering help as well. And I was fairly known in the community, but I'm not one to ask for help. And people just started coming to me after um, I started getting my message out there. Um, Heather, do you have anything to add in regards to that? I do. Um, I'm a little bit the same as Jennifer. It was difficult for me to reach out to people. You know, you feel like you don't want to be a bother. And I was surprised at the number of people that really wanted to step up and were waiting for an invitation. And so I would just, I would just challenge everybody who's thinking about this just to start calling some, some of their friends or put a message out on Facebook and say, hey, this is something that I'm considering. Would you like to be a part of this with me? Um, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at the number, a number of people who step up to be your team. Okay. It's interesting mentioning sort of bringing in, just putting sort of out on Facebook or whatever or on Twitter to try and find people to support you rather than hunting them down yourself, how people just sort of gravitate towards your cause and to help you. Yeah. And, but I would just caution that when you're doing that, you, you kind of want to know the people that are responding to right. you that step into your, uh, into your team. Um, 
do some sure. betting first before you in, invite somebody in. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's interesting. So I'm, I like I think most municipal electeds. I, I'm, I fall on that type A category, and like to you know have a very solid plan of things. So I didn't actually have a formalized team. Um, my inner circle for sure was involved. I, you know, I, my family and I, most of my extended family is in my region. So they were all involved. And then I kind of went through the list and went, okay, what stuff am I willing to give up control on? And I started with that piece first. So signs is an example. Um, I'm like, yeah, I don't care where you put them, who does it? somebody else can manage that and you can find locations for signs. These are my criteria. So I found people that I could give that to. Um, to what Heather was saying, for people that came door knocking with me, I was really, really careful of who that was because mm -hmm. I didn't want anybody speaking on my behalf unless I had 100% trust and they knew my position. Um, so I was very careful. So I had a very, very small door knocking team most mm -hmm. of the time. Um, same with social media. I kept that really, really, it was, I actually did most of my own social media for that very, especially the first time I ran, because I was very um, cognizant of what message I wanted to put out. And it had to be in my language um, with that. So, and, but like Heather and Jennifer, as you went, people kind of showed up and um, were there. And the money part for me, I tapped my inner circle for my first campaign. I, I didn't ask really beyond that broader um, scheme. And remember, it doesn't always have to be money. So think about friends that you have that maybe have some skill in building a website. They can donate you in kind. So they might right, do that website for you and they'll, they'll compute that. They still have to give you an invoice and you have to still disclose it, but it doesn't have to be cash. So think about who in your circle could provide you with some help and some services. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a skill you have, they really want, I don't know, an Afghan if you knit and you can trade, you can barter at the end of the day, but there's different ways to do that. Um, so it doesn't always have to be cash. And I found really good, and the second time I ran, I did a couple of really easy things of, um, you know, just a meet and greet at a local bar and restaurant, and I charged $25. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to disclose any of that. It's under that $50 limit. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you get 100 people, you all of a sudden have some, you know, some cash that's flowing through um, that that makes an impact. So don't don't feel like you've got to get these big, massive donations. It doesn't take much to get that. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of how I approached my team. And as I'm looking at a third election, I'm not sure yet what I'm doing with the with the team this time. Um, we have Rachel who's asked that she or she says she's running, considering running for council, and reason behind that she wants to make a positive difference in the lives of her community members. Do you feel you've made a difference in your community, and how so? I'm not sure who wants to start off this time. I think we're at my my spot again. Um, I, yeah, I do feel that we've made a positive difference. I think um, there's some policies and um, implementations we've done that I, for my community, I think are um, going to be very impactful um, for the future. Um, I also feel for myself personally, I've set a different bar for expectation on transparency. Um, so I'm one of the few counselors in my community that uses social media at all. And I'm pretty open and I will answer any question on my page. Um, I provide facts. I, I tend to take, work really hard back to that not immediate response to not having an emotional post. Um, and that has, that it has its own pros and its own cons, but one of the big pros is that I've become a very trusted source of information. If people really want to know what's happening, they reach out to me and go, can you answer this? Or if they see something going offside on another page, I get tagged a lot for that reason. Um, so those are all things that I think are positives for government and I feel I've contributed. Okay. 
Uh, Jennifer, how do you have any comments on, on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel I feel similar to, to Tanya in the sense that changing the way we communicate with our residents, um, not expecting people to come to us, but finding ways to get the messages to them. And not just in one way, but in multiple ways and continuously and consistently. And so, so that alone, if, if my term was done now, I am pleased with those shifts in our community. And, um, and I think that's the great thing with being on council. You're always, you're in the forefront of the conversation. You're, you're there always looking for solutions and, and ways to, to move your community forward. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And Heather? I think uh, 14 years ago when I put my name forward, we had a council that really focused on uh, the bricks and mortar type of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, when I, I was going before them on a fairly regular basis, I was trying to build a playground for heaven's sakes with the, with the school. <laughs> And trying to talk to them about, you know, there's a real social deficit in our community and we're losing volunteers because people don't have places to gather. You know, we don't have um, places or events for people to get together and sort of grow that community spirit of the volunteers. Um, remember, we are so close to the city of Lethbridge that, you know, people start, you know, they shop there, they recreate there. And so that was that was really important to me. How do we build that strong sense of community in here? And right. you know, I'm really proud of of the changes that we have made. You know, we have a, um, you know, we have sort of strong recreation plans. We have playgrounds throughout our community now. Uh, we've just built a, a spray park. So, and and we have several community events that have actually had people want to move into town because they they bring their children and they hang out as families and. They, Hey, this this feels great, you know, mm -hmm. to be a part of this. So, um, yeah, I'm really proud of of those those kinds of uh, changes that I brought in, yeah. or or we as a council have brought right. in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, our next question is: uh, Somebody's asked, how important is it for a woman to have a work or business background behind her and on her resume? Do you think it helps to be currently working in the business sector when running? for office. Um, we'll start this one off. We'll start with Jennifer, then head on to Heather and Tanya to follow. Yeah, and this is why I love municipal politics so much is I think the best um, high functioning councils are bring a variety of backgrounds and you certainly don't need a business background. You, everything from teachers to childcare to homemakers to um, I'm a real estate agent full time. Everybody has a voice at the table, and in this campaign, it's it's important because you are representing a section of your community, and you're that voice for those people. So understanding the value that you bring to the table, and and own it. Okay. And Heather. I think that is absolutely the most important key is understanding that we have all have our own perspective. And if we have everybody sitting there that has the same kind of experience, um, you know, we're going to have sort of one perspective driving the discussion. Um, I, I just have to say my very first term, there was a lovely old gent that was on council and had been there forever. And he said to me, uh, you know, he said, you know, your problem is you, you think too much like a mom sometimes. <laughs> and I kind of wore that as a bit of a badge of honor thinking that's okay because none of you other folks do. So I'm bringing a bit of a different perspective in our decision making. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think having that diversity is incredibly important. Yeah, um, I totally reiterate what my colleagues, but I'd ask the question back to you. So you're a voter. Does it make a difference for a guy if he has a business degree? And and so think about it from that perspective. Does it mean as if it was a man, would you vote for one man over another if he had a business degree? So I think you have to turn that back around. We're hard on ourselves as women. We expect that we need to be the nth degree of the nth degree. And, and that's 
society has institutionally has, has groomed us for that. Um, but I think that that's, that's the lens that I've really gotten better out of. Am I asking my, myself this question because I'm judging myself as a woman? And if I, would I ask the same question of a male colleague? And it's interesting, my response of, oh yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think anything of this if I was my male colleague. So I, I turn that back to, but I think the other piece that where business I found, especially municipally, well, government in general, but you see it more and more happening at municipally, where that business lens comes in, is I hear this comment a lot, government needs to run like a business. And the reality of the matter is government isn't a business. Does government need to be more efficient and more effective? Absolutely, but it is not a business. You do not elect a board of directors like you do for council. You do not publicly have a say and disparage a board of directors like you do with a government. And it isn't, it is providing services to communities to build communities that are not cost effective. <laughs> our arenas and our rec centers lose a ton of money. <laughs> no business model would put those in um, because they do nothing but lose money. And, and that's not a negative. It's because we're here to support community and build good communities. So I, I challenge you out there to think about that if you're coming at it from, it needs to be more like a business. Um, Cause I, I can say that was my original thought, but once you get in there and you actually start to understand how it works, you're like, oh, I didn't know that. So back to that, what you should be doing to prepare now um, conversation, I'd reach out to a local elected right now, take them for coffee, ask them, Ask them, what's the biggest opportunities on the plate? What are the biggest challenges? What do you see coming? What do you see are ships that need to happen? Um, look at their core strategic planning documents right now. See what their strategic plan looks like. See what their development plan looks like. Where is the vision that the current, current council has for the community? If you think that you need to change that vision 360 degrees and you're gonna do that in four, four, four years, you're probably in for a little bit of a reality check because it doesn't move that fast. And I don't mean to discourage you from running because that's not my intent. I'm just, I tend to be a bit of a realist. You won't change it that quickly. And I, I'm sure my colleagues have comments to add to that. <laughs> yeah, I'll add to that as well, Tanya. And that's definitely one of the points I wanted to make. Council and being in council, it's a long game. You are not getting any sort of instant gratification. You are you are waiting at least a couple of years in to start seeing the results of your own work, if not a couple of terms. Um, and sometimes you may never see the results of your work until your time on council is done. So um, you know you're building your community, but you, you have to be patient. Government takes time, change takes time, and um, and know that your efforts will be worth it, but, but stay in there because it does take time. And if I can add to that, I think possibly your first few years are really about your learning. <laughs> um, many people go into municipal politics thinking they're going to have, they, they need to change things. They have to affect this big change. And you get in there and the reality is, is that you have, you, I mean, you have to jump on all of the learning opportunities are available. There's several out there for you. And, and the first couple of years spending that time learning is really sets you up for great, you know, really great debate and really great decision making. Okay. We have a question from Abigail and she just wanted to get some insight into maybe a suggested campaign timeline in terms of maybe when you should start when your major milestones should be, does anyone have any advice? I think that that differs because depending on the size of municipality. So okay. I, I'm in a municipality of 30,000. I never started campaigning until I was a month out from election day. Okay. Um, this year things have changed. So this is the first year or first election that nomination day started for January 1st of this year. Um, so people can start a lot earlier. The campaign trail is long. 
it's tiring and it's hard. So really think about how early you want to be on it. It doesn't mean you can't do some preparing in the background and have things ready when you're ready to pull that trigger. Um, but don't feel you need to be there today. And, and I, I, well, I'll put a caveat on that. If you're deciding you're running for the mayor of the city of Luckbridge, you and you aren't no one in your community, you need to get out there and you need to be out there now. Um, if you're gonna run against an incumbent that's got a great track record, yeah, um, and you've got lots of incumbents running, you probably need to start doing some things that encourages that name recognition. Um, just Lethbridge is a bit bigger of a city, so you've got a far bigger plate to do that. But just remember a campaign, it, it's a long race and it is very tiring. So even me, I'm trying to figure out of, okay, can I do this in 30 days if I run? And can I do it at 60? Like, how, when do I need to announce? And I'm getting asked that question on a daily basis right now. And I keep saying, I'm not telling anybody until at minimum June. So that's me. Jennifer, did you have any thoughts on sort of timelines or? Yeah, and it is different this municipal election because we didn't have to put our papers in um, until a month out last time. Right. And now, now we were able to put them in in January. So I feel like we're, we're already campaigning in a sense. Um, our minds are, our wheels are always spinning. We're always on the forefront. Who else is running? What What's the competition? Um, what's this next council look like? And, you know, preparing for the next council. So um, as far as the formal campaign, I think the formalities could just be as simple as getting out there and learning what's happening in your community and making sure if anything, people know your name and just started putting that out in the forefront um, consistently. Do you have anything to add, Heather? You know, it, these are difficult questions to answer this year because of COVID. Everything looks very different. And so some of the things that we, that um, I spoke about earlier, um, I don't know what that's going to look like in the summertime. I don't know. But that's really the big key is just getting to every possible type of event that you can go to. And whether it's going to be virtual or, or not this year, but just, just getting in there and asking questions. And yeah, as my colleagues, it's both indicated, really just getting your name out there, getting people to know who you are. Oh, well, we had somebody ask sort of a interesting question. How did you know when you were ready to run? What made you sort of, was there some sort of moment that you, of clarity that you had that this is what I want to do, I want to go into politics or what led you to that decision? Maybe we'll start with Jennifer this time and then make our way around. Yeah, um, so I, I presented to council on some land use issues that related to real estate in 2013. And um, I was so nervous. I, I had never met a mayor, never met a council. I was, I was very, very intimidated when I went and presented. And when I went home that night, I was sitting with my girlfriend um, going over the meeting. And I said, nobody looked like me. There was nobody there representing. Um, at the time, I was a young mom. And um, really, there was one other woman on council. And right then and there, I started thinking, well, what's is there a place for me? And so I spent this summer getting rapid, building it up in my stomach. My gut was twisting with all of the thoughts like, oh my God, am I crazy? And then it was just like a switch. Like, no, I know I have something of value to bring the town of Fanchon. And, and then it was just went off from there. So, mm -hmm. Heather, what uh, made you decide to to initially run. Yeah. So I had been involved with Women's Space Resource Center and uh, and Lisa could speak to that about, um, there was different projects about getting women involved in politics and it didn't occur to me that I might be one of them at all. <laughs> um, and literally it was, it was something as ridiculous as trying to get a playground built and going before council trying to get and it was the same as Jennifer had indicated there was nobody there that looked like me um yeah, there was all gentlemen there 
And when I tried to talk about the social deficit in our community and, and the fact that we were losing volunteers and they, they really didn't, they didn't really get what I was saying. And so I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to just step in. I'm going to have to step in there and, and just start working with them from the inside. And yeah, and that was it. Okay. And Tanya? Um, like Jennifer, I looked around and I didn't see anybody that looked like me. Well, and I shouldn't, there was a, there was a female in council at the time, but um, there just wasn't, I didn't hear a voice at the table that sounded like mine. Um, and I think the big one for me, we, Okotoks, we are always dealing with water issues. So, but mm. we had, there was a water issue and a growth issue on our, on our um, table. And we, as a community had made this decision that we were going to cap our population, which I adamantly disagreed with. And I had worked with kind of behind the scenes to try and create a different dialogue around it. And I, I was really struggling with the, there was no collaboration happening. It was A or B. And I'm a huge collaborator because I believe the solution is in the middle. Um, I don't actually believe it's on one side or the other. It's actually in the middle. The best solution is in the middle. And so um, I come from a, a politically involved family. Um, my dad was on council in Claire's home, actually. And um, but my my grandparents and their we've talked politics since I can remember talking politics. So I always knew I would run. I just didn't know where. And it's funny how we discredit municipally. So I, when we talked about me running for politics, it was federally, it was provincially, there was never a discussion of running in my local community. But today I would never run provincially or federally because of the impact I can actually make in politics being involved locally. So if you are actually looking to make an impact, municipal government is the only place to do that. Um, and it is the best place to do that. It's not the only, it's the best place to do that because one, you sleep most nights in your own bed. Two, you will see your children if you have children, you will see them at least some point in time every day. Whereas when you have to leave your community to make changes, you won't see those changes come into effect in your community um, in the same way. And there is something highly rewarding about being able to take the call from the little old lady that, you know, um, is tired of the people bouncing the ball in the basketball court next to her house at midnight. And you've done something to make that better for her. And she phones you and she's just ecstatic because she can sleep now. There is something hugely impactful about that. Anyway, so that's kind of my long convoluted story of why I ran. But um, yeah, I didn't see somebody that was doing what I believed needed to be done at the table. And I've been taught from a young age, of, if you don't like something, you get involved. And that's why I got involved. Um, Jonathan, I know earlier there was a question asked about um, so many women mayors and is it easier for yeah. um, to run for council or for mayor and having right. done both, um, especially without a ward system, I would say it was way easier to run for council than it was okay. for mayor. The, the odds are better to get elected um, because it's one out of six in Manton and you just oh, need to have yeah. a certain number of votes to get. Um, when I ran for mayor, you it's just you <laughs> and it's all or nothing <laughs> and you're running against this other person and, and you are both showcased and it can get ugly and it is very, very personal where I found running for council and, and maybe the other, um, my colleagues can speak to this as well, running for council. There, it's a broader, you're able to, to spread your message a little bit differently and, um, and the odds are, are probably easier to get elected as council. And I do think it's good to start in the council position and because it does take a couple of years to get your bearings and then you learn how to be an effective councillor and then take that next step up to mayor. Right. Uh, somebody sort of, you sort of just touched on so how you can sort of get things can get ugly when there's just the two people running against one another. Somebody sort of asked of in regards to social media and there's so many things that can get out there, people start throwing 
mud back and forth between people. Do you think social media has made people more reluctant to run for council and for an office nowadays, or does it make you hesitant at all? And maybe we'll, I don't know who wants to start this one out. Social media has um, created a different discourse, particularly around politics in general. Um, and it, as women, we tend to shy away from that discourse far more um, than, than our male counterparts will. So I, I do think that what is seen on social media definitely impacts women. But I can, I can also comment that social media can be a good place to be. Um, and I, I'm very active on social media, um, as is you know Jennifer as well. But um, it's co about creating the framework that you're gonna you're gonna operate in. So if you can guide the conversation and you are choosing to engage in it, then social media can be effective and it can be an okay place to be. But that at the same time means don't go trolling to the you know, the rant and rave pages to see what they're saying about you today, because it's probably not good. Don't go looking for that other piece, because at the end of the day, it really comes down to, do you feel you're doing a good job? And mm -hmm. does their opinion of somebody that doesn't want to pick up the phone and have a conversation with you, does that opinion really matter? And I've got, as an example, I've got one person in my community that I have offered my phone number, no kidding, 25 times uh -oh. to have a conversation. She has yet to call me. And notice I also said the word she has yet to call me. Um, and so it's, it's they, social media gives that platform, but it's, it's not something to be scared of. It's just a, another tool for you to manage the communication that you're gonna put out on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and those those rant and rave pages or the taxpayer pages, um, I shut off the notifications on them and I go to them on my own terms. I do want to hear the conversations. I think it's important to know what's being discussed in the community. And I do add to the conversation and um, I feel that the temperature of the community has lowered because I am involved in the conversation. They know that the majority of our council watches those feeds and that we will respond to them. I call it the lion's den. And so we have to choose when we're, <laughs> when we're gonna engage. But I do think um, people appreciate that we are um, giving answers even if they don't like it. And, you know, that was definitely one of the hardest things for me as a, as a perpetual people pleaser was um, shedding that in the first couple of years. I will always have someone who disagrees with me. I will always have someone who outright hates me or um, just doesn't like what I'm doing or what I have to offer. And, and it takes a lot of a lot to process that at times. But um, really, we're here to represent the community in the whole, not just those loudest voices. And we have to be able to justify our decisions against that. Do you have anything to add, Heather? Um, I am not as active on Facebook or Twitter. Um, I prefer to email or, or have telephone calls. I've had people knock on my door and stand out on my step to visit with me about issues. I think the difference in size in our communities, mine is small enough that when I go to get my mail is where I probably have some of my best conversations with our <laughs> residents. Um, yeah, so I, you know, when, when you're in a very public forum like Facebook and you have people that maybe don't always have the, the right information and are feeling really angry, it's really difficult to engage in an authentic way with them. And so I, I really respect what both of my colleagues are talking about in engagement with their, with their citizens. I might have to look at that a little more. Okay. We had somebody ask, what age do you think is too young to run for office? They, she's a 27 year old woman who has a degree, has a good resume. However, even her own mother-in-law has told her that she doesn't have enough experience. Do you think there is a, an age? 
If you Do feel it. that you're ready and that you can, you can have something of value to bring, um, absolutely step forward. It doesn't matter. You know, I, we've got, there's lots of young men. Why can't there be young women? Um, I, again, it's, it's a, a stereotypical, a bias that's out there in society. So if you're ready to run, um, there's people ready to see you run and people ready to vote for you. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else had anything to add to that. Nope. <laughs> I think it was a pretty, a pretty resounding answer. No, there. <laughs> there's no to run at any age. Um, somebody else asked, what are the best volunteer opportunities to get your name out in the community? Um, does anybody want to, Jennifer, you'll start yeah. off on that one. Um, so I actually kind of created my own volunteer opportunities and because my business as a real estate agent, I was hosting events in the community. I hosted parade of garage sales. I hosted children's festivals, um, all just to bring people to the community. Um, I was on the school board as well, but um, I kind of just created my own little, we had a Halloween pumpkin events and things like that too. So. Um, but I know other people are getting involved with like library boards, school boards, children's committees, those kinds of things. And it might be, um, they might already have their boards established, but I'm sure even just showing up to them and giving your, um, like setting up and just getting out more whenever they're mm -hmm. asking, um, it's probably a good way to start. Okay. I don't think there's a bad place to volunteer. If you're going to give your time to your community, there's not a bad place to get involved. And um, every every organization that's looking for volunteers has voters. Every organization has other volunteers, and that creates other circles of opportunity. So, find something you're passionate about. Don't just volunteer because you're trying to get elected. Um, and that's probably one of the things that I would tell you: don't show up and join things with no intention of staying with some of those things, if you're successful or if you're not successful, um, because it's not showing up at the table authentically. Um, and, and it'll be noticed if you'd ever decide you're gonna run again and you happen to lose, or if you get elected and you disappear. Um, so be careful not to bite off more than you can chew in that regard, but find stuff that you're passionate about that you can get into and under, wanna understand more. That's, that's where I'd tell you. And Heather, did you have anything to add there? No, actually, I absolutely agree completely. That was going to be my really strong point is if you're looking at getting out and volunteering in your community, do it because it's something that you want to be doing. Right. Like using it as a, as a, a political stepping off point, um, it's, it's not going to be successful for you. And so we have another person asking, as members of local government, are you allowed to comment on news threads and stories that have come out in the news? Are there any restrictions on what you can post on social media or? Um, every council probably has a code of conduct. So right. we were required by the Municipal Government Act to have a code of conduct. Okay. Uh, typically behaviors are in there. Um, as a municipal elected, so it gets it gets a little bit harder when you start dealing with provincial news and federal news because they're party lines, right? So whereas as a municipal elected, you're representing all of the people in your community. You're supposed to do that federally and provincially, but they tend to get into their party's boxes. So you just have to remember that if you're going to engage on that type of news and provide comment and dialogue, make sure it's in fact Make sure you're really comfortable with, with the position you're taking and that you're speaking on behalf of yourself. That's probably the key thing if you're gonna get engaged there, but be very careful because you really never take off that hat of mayor or counselor. Even if you say, this is how I see it, you are still an elected official for whatever municipality you're in. So I, I pick and choose. There's lots of times on some of the stuff that goes on provincially that I have lots of comments but I am very careful about where I provide that. Um, and I, I don't typically engage in it unless I see it 
going really down the wrong fact rabbit hole in my own community. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that as well. It's, it's a balancing act because um, certainly if you're critical of your MLA or the provincial government or the federal government, you need money from them eventually and you need to work with these people. And um, no matter what opinion you're putting out on social media, regardless if it's in a news feed or you're putting it out as your own, I am always the mayor of Benton and there's weight with that statement that I'm making. And it will be that, oh, it, the mayor of Benton, this is how the citizens of Benton think. And so they'll collectively um, put us into that. So it's, it's a balancing act um, and it, it's political, right? So sometimes it is a posturing and I will put messages out to the provincial government because we need to get something done. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of times I bite my tongue. <laughs> okay, Heather? Um, I don't think there's much more to say. Um, it is difficult. Yeah. And I think we do spend a lot of time biting our tongues. And sometimes it's more difficult than other times. But we do have to maintain those relationships uh, with other levels of government. And that is, um, that's pretty critical for us. Okay. Let's scroll through the questions here. What are the most common issues that you've had to deal with while working uh, on council? Is it like Lisa stated earlier about do you see a lot of land issues or what type of issues do you see most common in your roles? And Heather, why don't we start with you this time? Uh, that really is the most common issue is land issues. <laughs> land and water. Um, we have had tremendous uh, periods of growth um, over my past terms and it's really managing that growth it's making sure that we do have uh, you know that we can annex land and 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 it's about relationships really as well i i might even say relationships are more important than than land uh, relationships with our neighbors relationships in the region uh, provincially uh, those are critical to allow us to um, you know, to, to grow and to, to move forward as a community. Uh, Tanya? Uh, land use probably definitely falls into that category, but I, I don't know. I, I don't ever feel like there's just one issue that we deal with. I, I, municipals, I think that was the biggest eye opening for me. I didn't realize how much municipal government dealt with. So I can talk about water, then we're talking about, you know, a tennis court, then we're talking about engineering plan designs, and then we're talking about land use, and that can happen all in one meeting. Um, so it's a lot of diverse topics, which I think I'm just going to come back to a question that Lisa got around, you know, how much information do I need to know and how much knowledge do I have to have? I think that big thing for me if, is know how to ask good questions, know how to read information and take information in. But remember, you do not need to be an expert in engineering to be a municipal elected councillor. All you need to do is trust in the experts that are in theory on your staff. And you need to be able to ask them the right questions of have they looked at the right risks? Have they, you know, those types of things. But you don't need to be an expert in you know, did they measure the engineering on that bridge properly? That's not your job. Your job is to ask really good questions and make sure that you've covered all the bases and you've done the right due diligence in order for you to feel comfortable making a decision. So I think that's what I love about municipal government is I get easily, I easily get bored and I can't say I've ever been bored in my job at council because we're dealing with so many different things all the time. And, and it's, 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 it's exhilarating. It's honestly, it's one of the best jobs I've ever had. And uh, I encourage more women to do it because we bring huge value to the table. Jennifer, do you have anything to add? 
Yeah, no, Tanya and Heather captured it perfectly. Infrastructure, I find, is one of the biggest things that we talk about, probably more so than land use. It, it's, it all ties in together, but, um, you know, especially our community, and I'm sure a lot of them, you're dealing with a lot of old infrastructure that you now need to tie into new infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't come in with any experience on wastewater treatment plants and I know way more than I ever imagined I would know about um, those types of things but I I would never want I'm not an expert I rely on the engineers I ask the questions and I do rely on the administration to give us the information if we don't have enough information we ask for more information so that we can make the informed decisions that we're elected to make. Okay. Can I just add quickly because I think that really important uh, issue is we're making some pretty big decisions and a decision is only as good as the information that we have in front of us. And so right. one of the things that I found when I, uh, my first term, it's, it's really difficult once you are starting to make a decision to change your mind and say, oh, you know what? I think that we should try this or, or we haven't looked at that yet. We have to explore this. And, and, and I will say that some of my male counterparts found that to be a bit of an uncomfortable situation to be in. And they thought that I may be in flip-flopping. <laughs> and, but as you're getting more information in, you have to be able to take on that new information and you have to be able to, to change your mind. And that is perfectly okay to do that. And I think that's something that uh, is not always, you know, people aren't always that successful with. Right. Rachel has asked, what has been the largest challenge of being an elected official during the uh, COVID pandemic? Does anybody want to start that one off? Uh, um. <laughs> Yeah, there are a couple of things. So there's no training manuals on how to govern during a pandemic and that goes for all levels. So we're all um, winging it at times. We're also all relying on um, higher levels of government. And I would say the most difficult by far has been dealing with the provincial government and um, the inconsistency in communication and um, and, and they're flip-flopping. It's okay if they don't have all the answers, but just stick with, with the phases that you're releasing so that we can build plans off of that. And that's been the most troublesome is that they, they change their minds on a dime when we've already made um, significant decisions based off of their last announcement two days ago. So I, I'd really want that consistency and communication um, from higher levels of government. Tanya? Um, I, I completely agree with what Jennifer said. Um, you know, I think that's probably the hardest piece is that as municipal electeds, we're not really in the driver's seat in managing this. Um, everything is coming at us from above. And even if we carte blanche disagree with it as leaders in our community, it is our responsibility to lead and do what is being asked of us to do. So sometimes that's really hard. But I think for me, the hardest part of the COVID pandemic is I feel extremely disconnected from my community. Um, so I, I've been very active and involved in my community in a variety of different ways. And not having those informal touch points, I'm really right now, I'm a, we're just coming up on a year. I'm really having trouble gauging what is the true pulse of my community. I have a social media pulse which is never really quite truth, but I don't, I, I'm missing that. You know, I presented to groups of moms, I prevented, presented to groups of seniors, and I did that on a quarterly basis. I haven't done that in a year. So, and they gave me, they're a wealth of information. So I am feeling extremely disconnected from my community. And I, and I as an individual counselor has done Facebook lives and those types of things to get to some group stuff, but, it's not the same. It just that one-on-one -on -one conversation is really lacking. 
And Tanya, do you find that you're also a little disconnected from your council as well? Because a lot of your meetings are over virtual and some of my counselors I haven't seen in a year, everything. And you're losing a lot of that, that energy that you have at the council table. And that's definitely one of um, the things I struggle with is we haven't had even four people in, in a room at any given time. And, and you lose that, that camaraderie and um, even professionalism at some time. Absolutely, I would, I 100% agree with that. And I think you can't undervalue the water cooler conversations with your colleagues, right? And you can't do that over Zoom, right? I can't have a water cooler conversation with Heather because everybody else is part of the water cooler conversation. And it's not about just having the small one-on-one, -on -one, but there's things I might say to Heather one-on-one -on -one that I don't really want to share and say to the whole group. So absolutely, that is a, it, it, it makes governing really hard. Yeah. I think also it's changed the quality of our debate. We don't spend as much time. There's not as much. Um, we tend to be doing a lot more just business as usual, just taking care of the business of the town without any sort of big thinking right now, because we're not sure where we're going to go. We're not sure what's happening. And, and, uh, you know, Jennifer, you're right. It's that inconsistency of messaging that we're receiving. Um, that's really, I wouldn't say it's freezing us in place, but it is really limiting our ability to uh, to look at, you know, big picture projects or, um, you know, move forward on some of the things that we have been working on. You know, it's we're we're sort of hunkered down. It, we're in a place of let's just let's just take care of business. Let's sh make sure people are safe, right? Okay. We had a question from BJ. They wanted to know what your experiences have been like working with being a member of council and sort of the fluidity between council and working with the administration, people who aren't elected, like uh, your CAOs, CFOs, or just your general administration. Jennifer, do you want to start? Yeah. And the sooner you can learn that, the more effective he'll be on council. Um, because if you come in not liking how things are operating or certain employees or, um, or anything like that, you will, you will just keep spinning your tires. And so learning how to work with your administration and the value that they bring to the table and, um, and, and really clearly understanding each of your roles, the value that you're bringing the perspective of the community to the conversation and they're bringing the, the data, they're working there eight hours, 10 hours a day um, within your community and making the town run and you have to respect their job and give them the opportunity to do their job and to find the information to bring to you. And, um, and, and that can be tough, and especially in a small community when you might be related to some of the town employees or sitting um, and playing baseball with some of those town employees. And they're saying, you know, I don't like how this is running in the town and it can get really blurry sometimes. So you've got to find out what, what makes sense for your community, but you absolutely have to respect your CAO and, um, and their role. Um, I think it's important too, as a municipal elected, um, as council, you only actually have one employee and that is your CAO. So if you're running because you think the transportation department needs an overhaul, you don't have a say in that. That is your CAO's job. You can maybe provide some recommended, but at the end of the day, day staffing is a CAO decision. So um, I think that is probably the biggest challenge is you don't, you're actually not the boss of all the people in the organization. You have one employee and that's it. And that's your primary communication piece too. So like Jennifer said, the building of that good relationship. Um, and I think this is a, one of the pre work questions we were asked of recommendations for what you shouldn't do in a campaign. Municipally, um, in, in municipal employees, every one of them votes. I 100% guarantee you every one of them shows up and every one of their family votes. So don't show, don't, don't be campaigning on um, there needs to be an overhaul in staffing. Don't be throwing certain staff under the bus. It'll be bad for you because they vote and their friends vote. Um, so keep that in mind. 
um, with that because um, of building a positive relationship and talking about how you work in relationships is is key to your success. Um, it, it's yeah, I can't undervalue the key to that piece um, enough. Yeah. And, and don't forget that your CAO is a wonderful resource for you as well. Um, you know, to be able to ask questions and to be able to learn, right? I mean, that is, um, and well, from my experience, they're incredibly happy to share their knowledge with you. Uh, incredibly happy to share with you, you know, past plans, past strategic plans. I mean, um, you know, just giving you that background information to catch yourself up to speed when you're first uh, getting on council. I have someone ask here, how have you handled if you ever made, realize you've made a mistake in the decision you've made while being on council? And how did you handle it and how did people react? Does anybody want to start off? <laughs> Jennifer? You have to own it. You have to own it. And, um, you know, we, we all are human. There's multiple layers to that decision, and um, anything could have gone wrong along the ways. And so, if you can explain the process that got you there, and then, but also own that that it wasn't my step. And here's how we're we're working to rectify that. It, it's all you can do. And of course, there'll be fallout. The the you may never recover with in some people's eyes, but um, don't sugarcoat it. Just bring the facts and um, and and try to bring a solution or let them know that you're working on a solution. Okay. And and I I concur completely. And it's really important. A little tie into our previous question please don't, please don't try to point fingers at the CAO or administration. And, you know, we, at the end of the day, we are the ones who are making the decisions and it's going to fall on our shoulders. And it's our responsibility to, uh, to own those decisions. Okay, somebody has asked, um, do you find it effective to build your platform on one particular issue or topic? Or do you think it's better to sort of be open to a variety of different topics? Um, what, how did you decide to sort of build your platform for running? Uh, Tanya, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I think this will be a good time to do a plug. So one of the things in determining and preparing for you to run is I always tell everybody that's thinking about running to read the book by Daniel Kluster, Five Reasons Not to Run for Municipal Government. Um, if you read that book, it will really help you in answering that question. But if you're, if you're running for only one issue, municipal government will bore you because either A, you'll get it solved right away and you'll be bored for the rest of the time you're there, or that issue isn't going to move as fast as you think it will. And you will be beating your head around the wall because you're not talking about the issue that you want to talk about. So municipal government is broad. It, there is so many things that we deal with in a community. So there's got to be more than one reason to get you to the table. Um, and I'm a huge believer that municipal voters will see through you if you only have one issue for why you're running. Um, and because we you know, aren't party based, they tend to vote for best candidates municipally. Um, you know, so yeah, you, you need to have multitude of reasons or you'll, you'll, you'll lose your mind at the council table with, yeah. with frustration. Anyone else have anything to add on that one? Heather? Yeah, um, and you know, while you're campa campaigning is not the time to start developing your reasons for running. <laughs> right. And I've seen that before where, where someone is door knocking and they're saying, yes, yes, I'm running so that I can build a skating rink. And oh yes, that's a good idea. I'm running so I can do this. And um, then you're sitting at a table with a number of other people and you have to get those things through now. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, or you know that you're, you're probably going to be a one term candidate, you're not going to make it again, right? And so it is, it's important to have a, a range of um, 
you know, what is my overall vision? And be able to take in as you're door knocking, take in what people are saying to you and say, I, you know, I appreciate hearing how important that is to you. And I, you know, I look forward to looking at it or, you know, these kinds of things, but um, yeah. Yeah, and I think you're bang on there, Heather, as you're campaigning, you will learn about the issues. And I think campaigning with an open mind, taking those notes and bringing them to the council table with no agenda, but you'll, you'll notice patterns through those conversations that you have with, with voters. And um, just take that into everything that you build when you build your strategic plan. You've heard enough, you, you've knocked on hundreds of doors, you should have a really good idea of what the core issues are with the community. And then as you, once you are elected and you really start to understand the budget and the reasons behind decisions, then you can really tie both of those together. Okay. Um, somebody asked, We've heard over and over tonight that one of the most effective ways of campaigning is door knocking. Is there methods of campaigning that you think are not as important that to, you should, shouldn't put much effort into that because it's not worth it? Or um, we can start with Jennifer. I see you've unmuted yourself. So yeah, um, I I think if you're campaigning, you need to be everywhere. So and you need to understand what works for you. Don't force it, do what comes naturally. Um, I'm not a type A person, I'm an introvert by nature, I need my breaks. I'm, um, and so I know what works best for me. And for me, I, I did door knock every single house in Nanton, but I also had door hangers that further got my message across and it was on both sides so if somebody wasn't there. I also was uncomfortable a few times and made sure that I was stepping into places that um, didn't necessarily want me there. You know, those coffee shop conversations where they meet at mm -hmm. seven in the morning. I made sure that I was there and gave them the brochures and said, do you have any questions? The people that I knew were my, my deepest core haters. I needed to put myself in front of them as well. Thank you. Tanya, do you have anything to add? Yeah, sorry, I missed okay. the mute button. Um, I think that that's really important is make sure that, especially if you're going to get out and go to different community events, don't just pick the community events that your friends go to. You need to pick some of those community events that hmm, maybe aren't your cup of tea, but there's, there's other people there because that's probably the biggest struggle for all of us is not getting into the echo chamber. Right. And, and making sure that we're hearing the broad community's message, because um, sometimes your own echo chamber is wrong. It, it actually doesn't resonate with the broad community um, and you need to be open to hearing that. Um, door knocking is it's first and foremost, but it is figuring out what the right mix is for you um, with that and, um, and and finding where the right balance and is of all of those. I found I got the most um, informative conversations one-on-one -on -one, because sometimes people in a group don't want to tell you how they see because they're too worried about what the group will think. Um, whereas their conversation will be very different in the one-on-one, -on -one, which is why door knocking is so important. And I think Lisa has her hand up, Jonathan. I'm not sure if you saw that. Oh, yeah, Lisa, you can jump in here. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what everyone is saying here. It's um, the uh, door knocking is important, door knockers, which is the thing that Jennifer was mentioning, right, that you leave on the door, we call those door knockers, uh, like leave behind material, um, even lit drops, like where you just have a kid that runs around and drops things to every house, that's very effective. What isn't effective is things that are high cost and low response rate, right? So you can send a piece of mail to each and every home in your riding and it will cost you an absolute arm and a leg and you will not find out one bit of data from one I voter and this will be not a good use of your money and time um so i would say like it, you know just like you wouldn't take out um you know a, a commercial on a television station to run in Colehurst, I would hope, Heather, you know, you wouldn't take out a big ad in the, you know, uh, uh, on TV. You also shouldn't do things that are that sort of one way. The reason that all of these 
things work that they're talking about is because it's two way, right? You're having a conversation with somebody, uh, whether it's at the coffee shop or the or the door. So that's what I was I just wanted to make sure people don't spend lots of money on one way communication. Now we have one another question here from Morgan, and they want to know when will you know that you're done being on council? When do you know that you're ready to to finish and move on to other things? Does anybody want to start us off on that one, Heather? Sure. Uh, just because I've been questioning myself about that <laughs> um, after 14 years on council, I thought perhaps I may not put my name forward again. Um, and, you know, I, on, and I, and I suspect it's probably because of COVID. I, I felt as though I didn't have the same kind of passion. Um, and that's your first, that's going to be your first cue is if you don't feel the same degree of excitement, um, when you're looking through your package and you're, you're ready to go, you're ready to collect that information and you're ready to, you know, to really get into a great debate about it. You know, you may you may be ready to step back. Um, so I think for each person, though, they're going to have their own experience with that. But we did have something come up, and I just got incredibly excited, and I got re-engaged and fired back up again. I think, oh, maybe I'm not quite ready to be done. <laughs> Tanya, Jennifer, do you have any comments? It's a tough question um, because right now that's all we think about. I'm sure we can all agree that um, I, I think about running for council constantly day in and day out. And am I going to run for mayor or am I going to run just as a councillor this time or am I going to run at all? And um, and I still get excited when I go to council meetings. I've still got work to do. And, and I feel like it will be a similar decision when I chose to run for council. Um, a switch will just go off that makes it feel right that I know I still have work to do. Or, you know, no, my time there is done and it's time for somebody else to, to bring in their perspective. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think like any job, when it stops being fun, um, you know, when when getting up in the morning is and going to work is something you dread, it's probably time to be done. Um, you know, and this this job is probably more than any other job you'll ever have. So public facing, it's you're in front of everybody, and you know, Lethbridge will be a little bit different, but and I can think I can speak for all of us. There's very few places in my community that somebody doesn't recognize me. So um, personal time gets harder to have when you're leading a life as a public official. Um, and, and so it starts to be weighing on those balances. I, I typically can't go out for dinner and not have at least three different, well, right now it's not the same, but can't have, th and don't have three different people. Oh, can I ask you just a quick question about this? And it's like, I'm here with my four girlfriends. Do we need to do this right now? So it's, it's those things, they all play, but. Yeah, my big one is if you're waking up in the morning and all you think of is dread about what you have to deal with, it's probably time to be done. Well, we're getting close to nine o'clock. So I think we'll, this will be our, this next question will be our last one for the evening. Um, and it sort of just touches on what you just said, Tanya. Um, somebody asked, how important is it to find a work-life balance as an elected official and especially in small communities, how do you find that balance when everybody recognizes you? Um, Penny, you can start us off. And... Yeah. This is a skill that I think we all are still trying to manage and master, um, but I think it's about setting your own boundaries. So it comes down to boundaries. What are your boundaries? So I don't leave the house without business cards. So if I'm not interested in the conversation, I hand them a card. My phone number's on here, my email's on here email me or call me now it doesn't work. And I've gotten really clear on those boundaries. So it is about um, setting boundaries of when you're in and when you're not. And social media is another one. You know, Jennifer and I were having this conversation when we started tonight, because I've been watching, she removed social media from her phone. And um, I, I am to that point myself of taking it off my phone and then being actively, I'm not going to get disrupted with it 
at its will, I'm going to choose to engage with it. So it, it's really defining your boundaries. I, I think it's also important to, uh, we're all responsible for our own balance and also within uh, the council as well. So there are numerous times when they're going to be planning, you know, when is, when is the best time to have a meeting. And I have watched other council members just go along with it when you know that that's, you know, their child's birthday or an anniversary or something. And it's like, you know, you need to speak up. <laughs> You know, these events are equally, if not more so important than the fact that another individual has a meeting during that time, right? So, so it's about just having the courage to have those really firm boundaries and be able to say, you know what, that's my son's birthday. That's not a good night for me. Let's plan another night, please. And, uh, and when you do those, your fellow council members will respect, you know, will respect you for that. Yeah, balance. It's it, it's it's a work in progress. It's um, it's tough. You know, as a business owner in the community too, there's there's no denying that my title absolutely has impacted my business, and and I understand that. And so I've had to expand my business because of that. Just some people are not comfortable having the mayor sell their house, and um, and I do struggle with that because. Council's my passion. I love it. It excites me. I tell people who go to the gym or train for marathons, this is my passion. This is what I love to do. And people might not understand how policies and bylaws can be exciting, but that's that's what excites me. And um, but also, yeah, drawing those lines in the sand, knowing that I need to with to take social media off my phone and go to social media on my terms. Um, I don't go to the post office because I know that's a place that I will, I, I always have to be on. So it, it's, it, it's difficult in those, especially in these smaller communities, everyone knows who you are. You people feel comfortable talking to your children about you and the decisions you've made. And that's just the reality of the role. They'll stop and knock on your house and think that it's their right just to, to knock on your door and ask you questions on your own personal time. It's what you signed up for and it's, you can't predict what people are going to do. Jonathan, I don't know if I have two seconds. I thought we'd actually see a question tonight on it, but um, this election is going to be different um, than a, a previous in that there's going to be referendum questions on the ballot um, that have been set by the province. The September 1st is the date that those questions are supposed to come out. So you're going to need to be prepared for what those questions are and try to have some understanding because you're going to get asked about them at the door um, as you're out and you're campaigning. It also has a huge potential of turning out a different voter than typically right. votes in a municipal election. So, and that has the potential to swing, potentially I'd be interested in Lisa's thoughts on this. I think it has a potential to swing towards incumbents because they tend to vote for name recognition, mm -hmm. but they're not actively engaged in the issues of municipal politics. They don't typically vote at the municipal level. Um, so those are things that you need to just keep in the back of your mind and play to. And I would love to hear Lisa's thoughts on this because I, I think it's going to change voting in this next municipal election. So it, it's something as we're all running, we need to be very cognizant and think about. And you are seeing the political parties, the changes to the Local Authorities Elections Act um, in the bigger centers. And I think Lethbridge is potentially at risk for this is political parties can be involved. Um, and that is a huge concern for municipal elected officials um, that party politics is going to come into play because it, it will it will spoil municipal politics and what makes it great. So that's my two cents just to. Uh, yeah, and you're you're exactly right, Tanya, you're very insightful on that. The uh, changes to the local elections act. Um, uh, not only does it do those things that you've said uh, with the ability to add, uh, it also will have the ability to have political action committees, uh, which is a lot more money. And Canute mentioned that in the uh, Q&A I saw, is this influx of money that could come into larger centers. So certainly Lethbridge is at risk. I'm not sure it's as much a risk in some places. 
Um, but certainly, you know, if I was maybe the mayor of a high, high river running again, I might be a bit concerned that uh, I had spoken out against the current um, uh, premier and I might be wondering whether he was going to, you know, have a political action committee to not have me elected. Um, in terms of incumbency, like incumbency has this huge boost already, like it's this massive boost, right? Um, the uh, What I'm seeing across the province though, and in Lethbridge too, a lot of the incumbents are saying they're not running again. Like we don't have very many mayors who are running again at the big city levels. Um, we, this, when you have a competitive race, you already have a different voter showing up, right? And then you're adding to it the, the possibility of, uh, or the likelihood of an equalization referendum. Um, and so you will be, those uh, voters turning out will be triggered to come for that vote, uh, and then we'll vote in on uh, on the ballot as well. Typically, you know, in Alberta, like municipal turnout is less than 30%. I think we could see upwards of 50%. Like, that is a significant difference. Yep. Well, that puts us right just past nine o'clock. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. It's been a wonderful discussion. Oh, Heather, you looks like you. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Emma. I, I, I was hoping that we might get a, a question on mentorship. Um, I know that, um, you know, there's a lot more success for first time uh, counselors if they have an opportunity to have any mentoring or if they have any, you know, really big burning questions, uh, particularly women in municipal politics. And I know that in the past that um, the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association did have a mentorship program. Um, I'm not sure if it's still in place or not, Tanya. And I think it's really good information for the people that are um, that have joined us this evening, if they are thinking about putting their name forward, to know that they can search that out. Tanya, did you have contact information for that or would we just direct them to the AUMA website? Yeah, I just go to the AUMA website, auma.ca. Um, there'll be lots of election stuff that'll be coming forward for materials and resources with that. Yeah, and so if, if if you would like to talk with someone who has been doing this for a period of time, uh, they will connect you with an individual and, and they can help you with your questions. And I think it's a great resource. That's some great information. Thank you, Heather. Oh, you bet. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. I know that you're very busy and you have your own lives and taking the time tonight to, to have a nice discussion. And I think we've all learned a lot and a lot of people thanking us in the comments and everything. So thank you for joining us. Uh, to our viewers, we will be having a, another session on March 9th, sort of just on more general information. Um, and Lisa will be joining us again. So if you have more questions for her, you can tune in on March 9th at seven o'clock again and register on our website. And Bonnie, just, do you have any? Yeah, I just also want to include that um, if you're considering running in the city of Lethbridge, the city clerk's office will be holding um, sessions kind of specific to Lethbridge um, in the spring. They don't have any dates yet, but do watch. Um, I'm sure they'll put it on their elections website, which you can get through via our website if you can't find it anywhere else. Um, so watch for that. And again, thank you ladies for joining us, for taking the time to speak and share your knowledge. And um, it's been great. Thank you so much. Everybody have a good night. Stay safe. Good night.